Hi folks, welcome to Experts in Isolation with me, Dr. Gareth Jowett, where we speak to people with experiences of isolation and extreme circumstances to try and all help us deal with the current lockdown scenario that we're facing. This time, I was very fortunate to be joined by Josh Bratchley, MBE. Josh was awarded his MBE for his role in rescuing 12 boys and their football coach from a flooded cave in Thailand in June 2018. And fast forward to April 2019, uh, where he found himself trapped in a cave uh, in Jackson, Tennessee. And this is what our conversation really focuses on in terms of unpicking that experience with Josh and also looking at the transition when he was freed from the cave, as well as his wider motivation for why he uh, engages in this extreme and potentially dangerous uh, pastime. Josh, thanks very much for coming on. I guess if we could just start perhaps by you telling us a little bit more about what you do and the types of experiences you've had in terms of isolation or confined spaces, perhaps. Yeah, okay. Um, so obviously you've already introduced me. My name's Josh. I do uh, a, a few kind of strange hobbies caving cave diving the two primary things that i do from a sort of a uh, hobby perspective my job is also the kind of job that can take me to some fairly isolated places um so i, I work as a meteorologist for the met office um but i guess that the primary thing that's going to be related to this conversation is uh is the uh, the caving and cave diving um my, my experience with isolation is is quite fairly extensive i guess um related to those i uh, do go underground for extended periods of time um, up to, I think I've done up to nine days at a time before um, without coming out to surface. And uh, often that's with a team though, you do have people around you. Um, but I also do a number of solo trips, um, particularly cave diving, that's often done solo. And sort of in terms of, you mentioned then your, your general experience. Um, I wonder if you could give us a, a little bit of insight into maybe some of the more challenging scenarios you've uh, kind of encountered. Yeah, in terms of isolation um, in particular, yes, the, the 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 incident in Tennessee in April 2019, where I I ended up uh, stuck on the wrong side of a flooded passage uh, in a small air chamber uh, for 27 hours. That um, that was as far as um, isolation goes, quite extreme. Uh, no access to the outside and uh, on your own as well, um, with essentially no resources. Um, so a little bit of a survival situation. Fortunately, I was uh, rescued from that situation, but uh, the 27 hours were were quite long. Uh, they certainly felt quite long. I had no uh, real uh, indicator of time apart from my dive computer, which I could look at to 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 kind of check it. Although I I didn't really make a point of doing that too much because um, I was aware that it could be quite a while. Yeah, that that's probably my my main experience with extreme isolation on, on an, an unexpected level. Uh, where I wasn't entering the environment with the expectation to be isolated for a long period of time. In terms of that experience, Josh, how did it kind of come about? You know, at what point did you realise you were in trouble? So cave diving's got a lot of principles and a lot of, of rules that you need to abide by, um, hence uh, the extensive training that cave divers undertake um, to safely uh, do it as a hobby. Um, one of those primary rules is uh, maintain connection with the, the dive line. And for a variety of reasons, unfortunately, uh, it does happen uh, occasionally that, that divers do lose connection with that line with, with varying outcomes. Um, so w when that happens, um, that, that, is, that is a big problem and needs to be, needs to be rectified. And, and there's a whole new set of, of risks and problems and hazards that, um, that kind of develop from uh, losing connection with your with your dive line. Your dive line connects you to the surface at all times. It, it's your way out. Um, if you imagine, like um, when you walk into a complex building, uh, certain hospitals, for instance, they have uh, painted lines on the floor, and you follow those lines to certain departments, etc. Um, essentially, what your dive line is, you, you stick to that, and it'll you know if you turn around and follow it back out, you'll get back to the exit. Um, and losing connection with that is a big problem. So that was when I realized that things were not going to plan. Mm -hmm. And after that, it was just a series of um, a series of attempts to analyze the situation and reassess it. And um, when it continued to not be 
uh, ideal, like the ideal situation would be I, I'd find the line again and I'd exit the cave. When that didn't happen, I then had to find uh, other ways to uh, not drown, basically. Um, and one of those was to surface into a part of the cave that I knew to have airspace. Okay. Um, and I guess upon doing that, um, what were your feelings at the time? Like, um, were you fairly calm in terms of having your training and, you know, your expertise in, in that uh, scenario? Or, or did the panic set at that stage? There was no panic. Um, when, when the dive line was lost, uh, there was the immediate feeling of uh, of, reg of regret that that happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there was uh, the immediate kind of um, the, the, the very obvious uh, acknowledgement that I needed to find that line. And I became very focused. Mm -hmm. I then uh, spent time trying to find that line. Um, it's, it's quite a high pressure situation when when it's suddenly a little bit more out of your control. Um, but I, I was aware that um, that I, I needed to not let the situation overwhelm me, and that I needed to to maintain my focus to either find that line or if that was not uh, fruitful, I'd, I'd need to start to think of other ways to 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 try and solve the situation and reduce the risk to myself. So there was no panic, but there was definite heightened senses. Um, and definite uh, focus on the task at hand. And as things continued and as time went on and finding the line didn't happen, um, I, I then had to start uh, making my way to that to that airspace uh, before essentially time ran out. Um, panicking certainly wouldn't have helped, um, but it, it was a situation where I, had, I, I became very aware um, and very focused. Yeah. Um, and when you manage to make it to the airspace, um, obviously you're having to sit it out for a, a long period of time there. Were there any strategies that you kind of used to, to help you through that period? So firstly, a description of where I was. Mm. Um, so I, I, surf I surfaced into airspace after the issues underwater. The airspace is, is pitch black. There's no connection to the outside. Um, it was a reasonably large airspace in terms of um, bird's eye view down quite a large spatial area, but the majority of it flooded, very little dry land. Uh, there was a mud bank at the far end of it, uh, which was quite steep, which was quite a struggle to get out of the water. I had to uh, main, like remain in the water for a, for a reasonable period. Um, and, and I took one of my diving fins off to start digging at that mud slope to try and flatten it out so that I could get out of the water. Um, I was quite aware that I could be in there for quite a long period of time and uh, I, I, I would need to um, remove myself from, from, from being immersed because my body temperature would reduce quite fast if I, if I stayed in the water. So um, I dug that little ledge, managed to get uh, most of myself out of the water it was just my legs that remained in there and over the next few hours i did make that ledge a bit bigger so it's just the bottom half of my legs in there i also took off the diving equipment and put it underneath me to insulate myself from the cold wet mud um because i had a dry suit on fortunately i i inflated that to a reasonable degree before removing all the dive kit and putting it underneath so that i had the the insulating air around me and an insulating layer between me and the mud which allowed my body temperature to stay as high as possible so that i wasn't a, like basically useless and hypothermic in the event that someone found me after an extended period of time that was uh that did work when i was found 27 hours later i was um i wasn't particularly hypothermic i, I was still I still had my senses. I was still able to dive myself out because uh, I also left myself enough gas to be able to uh, exit the cave. I did go back into the water a few times uh, to try and find my way out uh, from the air bell uh, to see if the visibility were clear. Um, mm -hmm. Like after after an hour or so or half an hour or so at varying intervals where I'd go back in, see if the visibility was better and see if I could locate that dive line. But the visibility didn't improve much um, over the first few hours of me being uh, trapped in that air bell um, for a variety of reasons, uh, including other divers in the water. There, there was just this situation where the, visib the visibility didn't improve and that, and that wasn't going to, to work for me. So in the end, I, I realized that I needed to still save enough gas to be able to get out under my own steam. So I then sat in the air bell. So the first few hours were kind of taken up with digging that ledge, kind of 
sorting out the kind of little survival um, kind of techniques, I guess. You know, all the little things. So one, keep me busy. Two, keep me warm by constantly moving. Digging a ledge does, does warm you up. And then you can keep that heat by insulating yourself. Um, and then obviously diving in and out did use up a bit of time as well. Not well, that was the primary purpose of it, but it had that effect. Um, afterwards, it was just, I mean, trying to keep busy. I don't know if you've ever been st stuck uh, like in a, in a situation where there is literally nothing to do. Um, but if you imagine just be, being in your living room, your floor is lava and you're sat on your coffee table. And the, all the walls are blank and yeah. there's nothing to look at. And there's just, you know, there's just dripping noise. Um, that, that's the kind of sensory deprivation. There's, there's not much to do or see. Um, nothing tends to move down there. You can just hear the odd drip. Um, so a little bit of trying to keep your, keep your senses, keep yourself sane. I turn my light on every now and again to refocus my eyes. Um, just kind of be able to make sense of the environment around me before closing my eye, uh, before turning my light off again. And a uh, little bit of singing. You know, things that people tend to do when they're walking in the park alone still works in that kind of situation. Mm. Um, so uh, just basically trying to pass the time. I, I didn't actually do a huge amount. I was, uh, after a while, I was fairly content with just kind of lying there with my eyes closed, trying to use the least amount of energy possible once I'd already sorted out all the things at the beginning. And then I could just conserve that energy. Didn't really manage to fall asleep. That would have been the kind of the best usage of my time but also if you fall asleep you then lose awareness of, of the situation that you're in potentially and then you you have the risk of waking up in a in a poor state um hypothermic or whatnot whereas instead being awake i could sort of start to feel myself getting a bit cold and i could do some movements and try and keep my body temperature up or move my legs out of the water for a small period by kind of curling up into a ball but that wasn't sustainable long term because that's really not very comfortable yeah um Fascinating stuff, and you kind of um, you mentioned that uh, idea of time um, a little bit earlier, actually, and I wonder um, that idea of time perspective does it just completely go out the window, or is there some sense of about how long you've been there, or, or how does it kind of work? So. I think some studies have been done to show that like people have a circadian rhythm and over a long period of time they'll eventually start to get into a into a kind of into a a rhythm that matches up reasonably well with the day maybe displaced slightly but over the over only sort of 20 odd hours you have an inkling um but without any daylight and any reference point uh, it is quite hard to tell um and and you're not really doing the things that you'd usually do. You're not maintaining the same amount of energy output. So being tired doesn't really doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't mean that it's getting to bedtime. It just means that you've been exerting energy and you've got nothing else to relate to. So I think the concept of time does does disappear a bit um, when you when you're not actively checking. But I did I did check the time on a couple of occasions, which did kind of bring me back in line. And then I could always have a slightly closer reference point. It wasn't like the last time I checked my watch was before I went in kind of thing. Yeah, sure. What happened in terms of uh, the uh, the rescue? The, the total kind of rescue duration from the uh, from Ed entering the water to um, to coming back with me was about 45 minutes okay. um, from, from what I gather. So it's um, wasn't particularly long. Uh, I think it, uh, I think when he went in, the visibility had settled by that point. There'd been uh, many hours uh, since anyone had entered the water, um, mm -hmm. so visibility was was generally quite good, and it and it was still reasonably good on on exiting. Yeah. Um, so that that was a, a massive help. Um, so yeah, once he'd connected the lines up and and surfaced to where I was, it was a matter of me just kitting up, um, and then exiting with him. Is there anything that we can kind of transfer to the current scenario in terms of the lockdown? Do you think, or are there two scenarios just completely distinct? Um, interesting because the current lockdown is obviously substantially longer, mm -hmm. but being stuck in a in a wet muddy room that you can't escape is substantially more locked down so i you know I, I think being locked down in the current situation where we're all um unable to go and socialize with other households necessarily um and and we're kind of we're only able to exercise once a day in a local area or, or at least that, that was the case for, for most 
um, it, you still have a degree of freedom that, that allows you to sort of shout at your neighbor over the garden fence if you have one, or or you can still do what we're doing now, chat to people on, on Zoom and online. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we've not all complete, most of us haven't completely lost the ability to to talk to others and to and to socialize and unless you 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 don't have those kind of social circles which i'm aware that that there are not a large number of people also that don't have that and it and lockdown will be substantially harder for them most people have plenty to do in their own home it might not be exactly what they want to do and it might not be perfect in terms of like interesting tasks but whether whether it's chores that you've been putting off for for a year or or just being on facebook or, or chatting to people it, it's it's something um mm. but it's not it's not necessarily to say it's easier because it's lasting a very long time it's really difficult to compare and i wouldn't really want to i, re- I wouldn't really want to draw too many comparisons with it because i also went into when, when you do cave diving you, you you have a certain mindset when you go underwater it's not the same kind of mindset that you have when you sat on your sofa at home um and I, I just think the the effects are all going to be very different. I mean, the getting trapped inside a cave was extremely unexpected and very sudden. Uh, the lockdown, you know, was warnable. We we saw other countries doing it, but it's it's very it's just lasting a very long time. And I think that's probably the, the most difficult thing about it is there's no real end in sight. Mm. Um, and I guess it affects li- literally everyone. Yeah. yeah. Do you feel as though your experiences as a caver? Um, um in any way have helped you kind of through the the current circumstances we're living in i mean i I wouldn't say that i'm any um like if i was to be put in a in the exact same situation as someone else during this lockdown there's nothing to say that i would be any better at it Mm. so i don't necessarily think that caving and cave diving and things like that are necessarily going to make me any better at dealing with a with an unprecedented uh lockdown um i mean i I do know that i can spend pretty much 27 hours doing absolutely nothing and and i haven't gone insane and so so you know that's something but they're just so totally different How were you when you came out of the cave? I, like I was surprisingly okay throughout basically all of it in, in terms of like my my own my own thoughts, my own thought processes. I was very aware that people had been affected outside the cave, uh, my friends on the surface, for instance. And and so uh, I, I had an overwhelming kind of feeling of guilt from it. So, so yeah, I, I think I was concerned for other people and, and I think I was very... Uh, partially unaware of my own reactions for for a little while you know i kind of boxed it in a bit and just kind of tried to kind of get back to normal had a, we had a bit of a party afterwards to kind of bring back some uh, normality um but you know it, it wasn't lost on me that that other people got hurt and that i would need to process this at some point um and sit down and kind of deal with what had just happened and have a think about everything uh, write up some reports and and then look at the, the mistake that had been made because obviously it went wrong that mistake was made um mm. and learn from it I, I, you know i've only been cave cave diving for by that point it was about six years i think can't give you an exact number actually but about six years still fairly juvenile um still a lot to learn and i, I didn't want to forget that and i didn't want that to be lost i wanted to make sure that whatever happened in tennessee is it, i can learn from because learning is an ongoing process no matter how uh no matter how long you've been doing something or no matter what you've done in the past um yeah. so i i was i was beating myself up a little bit um and but i was also feeling extremely grateful for for what for what ed did um getting me out of there and my friends on the surface who who really did have to deal with it mm. Yeah, and how did you find that sort of transition back then? For a mixture of circumstances that aren't simply to do with what happened, I, I didn't go cave diving for a little while, and that was um, it was it was mostly work related rather than um, uh, rather than actually uh, not wanting to go cave diving. But the delay uh, certainly uh, made it so that the first time I went cave diving afterwards, I was very cautious, as as I always am, but more more so in the sense that uh, a little bit apprehensive. Um, which I think is fairly natural. I was fully expecting that, uh, but but now, or at least pre-lockdown, 
um, essentially back to normal. Um, I, I've been to, to France since and done some lovely cave dives. Um, so I think, you know, it, if you were to draw it as a, as like a, as a line, it was a, it was a dip in the line that's recovered to where it was, if not, if not above, um, I think above simply from the fact that it's a learning process and that, and I have learned from it and I've, I've looked over everything that happened and chatted to the people involved and the other divers involved. Um, so I, th I think, yeah, things are back to normal. But like I say, the, the reactions that I had afterwards, it probably took a couple of months before I totally come to terms with it, done everything I wanted to do post incident, um, looked into what had gone wrong, looked at, looked at myself and gone, okay, like what are your feelings and, and how have you processed this? Um, do, do you need to talk to the others involved and, and sort of looking at whether I, I dealt with it appropriately immediately after the, the incident or whether I only kind of figured out the correct way to deal with it afterwards. But I think, I don't think that's particularly unusual. And, and I think it was just important that I did that. And I looked at the situation from an out, outside perspective um, when it wasn't immediately post incident, when things had settled a, li settled a little bit. Uh, outside of Tennessee doing sort of long periods underground um, cave diving expedition to Mexico in 2018. That was the one where we spent nine days underground um, oh. with, with just a few of us uh, in the team. Um, cave diving through multiple underwater sections to get to the far end of a cave to then look at pushing the end of it. Right. Um, it's a long time to spend without seeing daylight, without seeing sunlight and living off of uh, essentially uh, the same powder mix for, for dinner every day. Um, you yeah. know, it's, it's, you know, in terms of life's little amenities, quite mundane. But what keeps you going there is the the is the goal that you have, the, the kind of mission that you're on. You you have aims, you have objectives, and you stick to them. You focus on them, and it keeps you it keeps you amused. You have your ups and downs. Um, mm. You you need to make sure that you get on very well with the people you're there with. Um, you know, you, there may be little kind of uh, disagreements now and again, but you've you've got to be adults about it and deal with it, which which we did. Um, and it's it's certainly uh, easier to have a mission. Um, and be able to focus on something for that period of time than it is to sit with no goal and no aims apart from to survive for 27 hours. What drives you to do it, Josh, in terms of uh, that wider motivation? What kind of sparked your interest in it to start with? And uh, Going places that very few people have ever been is, is one of the key ones. Exploration, uh, it's, it can be quite groundbreaking. You, you are increasing the size of the world map albeit the underground, but, um, you know, people haven't been doing that outside of certain pursuits for, for many, many, many years. We, we know what the world looks like. We can see it from above. We know what the top of mountains look like. You can fly a helicopter over most of them. Um, the only way you get to see what's beyond the limit that's currently established in a cave is to, is to get yourself to that limit and push beyond it. And there's no other way yet so uh that's that's where the excitement comes from so there we have it folks some fascinating experiences that uh josh was uh, alluding to there as he pointed out potentially they're uh, too far removed from the current lockdown scenario uh that we're currently experiencing to make direct comparisons but i'm sure you'll agree there's some nice extended metaphors there in terms of uh, things like as all feeling as though we might have lost our dive line, given that the uh, different way in which we're having to uh, live and come to terms with the uh, very different circumstances that we're facing at the moment. Uh, my thanks to Josh uh, for giving up his time and being so candid with those experiences. Uh, if you've enjoyed the video, by all means, check out the other videos uh, in the series. And otherwise, stay safe, stay well. See you soon, folks. Bye bye.